Hanifa Rahmatullahi Alayhi was not only a knowledgeable person who knew how to explain things and knew how to clarify things, he also knew how to get himself out of situations, but he was also a man, definitely, first and foremost, of great, great faith. He asked his student, how was your teacher, Abu Hanifa, in character? And this is how he described it. He said, he was extremely pious. He avoided forbidden things all the time. And he remained silent and absorbed in his thoughts most of the time. So he didn't speak much unless he had to. He answered questions only if he knew the answer to them. He was very generous and self-respected. He never asked a favor from anybody in his life. He shunned the company of the worldly-minded people. So he didn't like sitting around people who talked about money and houses and property. And people who held worldly power, he didn't like sitting with them. And he didn't like having a position or status. He avoided gossip and slander. And he only talked good things about people even if there was bad to talk about them, even against his enemy. He only spoke well or he, or he was silent. Not like us today. If we hate someone, we mention every name under the sun today. Abu Hanifa, even his enemies who imprisoned him and whipped him, he had nothing to say but only good or he was silent. And this is what Allah is attesting his life. He had profound learning abilities, generous with his knowledge as well as his wealth. This was Abu Hanifa. Imam Abu Hanifa was endued with intelligence beyond measure. Very, very intelligent. Look at something, he was, he was full of reasoning, very rational person. Looked at things in common sense and looked at things from all perspectives. Every way, four-dimensional thought, four-dimensional. A lot of us were just one-dimensional. He was four-dimensional. I'm going to give you some examples very soon. Abu Hanifa was one full of reasoning. And the Romans sent an envoy, a man, to try and trick them, to try and put doubt about their religion. So a man came along and he said to the people, gathered people, said, I have come with three questions. He stood up and he said, My first question is, Who was there before God? Before Allah, who was there? And then the second question, Right now, Allah is facing in which direction? And number three, What is Allah doing right now? Abu Hanifa was only about 10 years old or 12 years old at that time. No one could answer. So he said, Let me answer, Father. So he came up and he said to him, as for who is before God, uh, we know this narration. He said, count from 10 backwards. And he counted until he reached zero. He said, what's before one? He said, zero. So what's before? He said, nothing. Don't give me this minus one, minus two. That's actually a number. Zero is basically the end. And he said, what's before one? He said, nothing. He said, so the Lord of the worlds, the glorious creator, how can he not be the beginner of everything when in... In actual common sense and logic, you count backwards and you end up with one and there's nothing before that. Then he asked him the second question. He said, what about God? Where is he facing? In which direction is he facing now? He said, if you light up a candle, what do you see? He said, light. He said, in which direction is the candle light facing? He said, uh, it's not facing any particular direction. Light, light is facing everywhere. Right? Facing any particular direction. He said, then what do you say about Allah who is the light of lights? Nurun ala nur. How can I say which direction he is facing? As for the third answer, he said to him, to answer your third question, you have to come down here and I go up there because the people want to hear the answer. And if you want to, you know, basically get me in your question, then at least let everybody hear my answer. It's only fair because you made your question in front of people. Let me answer in front of the people. So he thought that's common sense. So we got up and he said, what is Allah doing right now? He said, right now, He is making the one who is on falsehood come down off the pulpit and the one full of success to climb up the pulpit to answer and prove you wrong. So He said, this is what Allah is doing right now. Every action that happens in life, this is what Allah is doing. Right now, Allah is doing this. If it wasn't for God, we will all be non-existent, dead, gone. Because we don't keep ourselves alive. Allah keeps us alive. Allah keeps everything in motion. It doesn't keep itself in motion. Right? Nothing keeps itself in motion, it comes to an end. Imam Abu Hanifa was also asked about how can you prove God's existence. As a child, he said, well, if you had a ship that was sailing in, this, in the sea, 
and it had no people to steer the boat, no people were paddling, no sails, uh, no propellers, nothing. Just a piece of boat in the sea. And you wanted it to sail from one direction to the other and reach that destination. Can that ship reach its destination by itself? He said, no. He said, well then, how can this world and your motion and your heartbeat and your existence and motion, all of that, live and go without someone controlling it? Just like the ship cannot control itself and maneuver itself without any you know, electronics and without any satellite, without any of this, then how can you be able to move and live without someone guiding you and being your navigator and control? So Imam Abu Hanifa, just to illustrate how intelligent he was even from a very young age before he even reached, received Islamic knowledge. The way I would describe Imam Malik in one title would be that he was a man of aura, a man of absolute respect, meaning, I don't mean that, I mean every scholar was a man of aura, but when I talk about Imam Malik, when you looked at him, even if you didn't know that he was an Imam, his features strike you and you find something inside of you forcing you to respect this man. We call this in Arabic Hayba, an aura, the man of aura. He used to say, there is nothing more harder upon me in life than when I was asked a question about halal or haram, is this permissible or not? Because I am representing the hukum, the ruling of Allah Himself, the creator of the world. And he spent his whole life in Medina, Medina al-Shari, Medina al-Munawwara, in the land of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He never left Medina al-Munawwara his entire life only to Mecca when he went and did Hajj or Umrah. In fact, not only did he ever never leave Medina al-Munawwara in his life until he died and he lived for 90 years. 90 years he lived. He never even rode on a camel or any transport vehicle in his entire life when he was living in Medina. Because in his wara, in his righteousness and love for the Prophet sallallahu and as a role model, he saw benefiting fitting in himself as the scholar of Medina to always have his feet stuck to the ground of the land where the body of the Prophet ﷺ is buried. He saw it disrespectful as an Imam representing his deen in the highest esteem to lift himself off the ground out of respect for the Messenger ﷺ while his body was in the ground. Never in his life did he ever lift his legs off the ground? Can you imagine that? 90 years. Except when he went to Hajj or Mecca outside of Medina. A young man, the age of about 13 years old, in the time of Imam Malik, when Imam Malik was in his middle ages, a young boy by the age of 13, his mother from Mecca, his mother said to him, My son, you are now well known. You have memorized the whole Quran and you have memorized Hadith and you have memorized poetry. I want to send you to Imam Malik to learn his adab, his character, before you learn his knowledge. So she got him ready and she wrote a letter to the Prince of Mecca, the governor of Mecca, who was, happened to be her cousin, this woman's cousin. She wrote a letter to him to send a letter to the governor of Medina to go with her son to Imam Malik, basically to intercede for him, to become his teacher. So this young boy took this letter from his mother, from the governor of Mecca, and she packed him some food and sent him off. Young 13 year old going through the deserts to Medina, seeking knowledge. He reached the governor of Medina and gave him the letter of the governor of Mecca. And the governor of Medina, his face changed. He started to sweat. The young boy looked at him and said, what's wrong? He said, Wallahi, if the governor of Mecca asked me to walk barefooted in the middle of the desert with nothing on my head, it would be easier than for me to go to Imam Malik's house because he had so much respect for him. So the boy innocently said to him, well, you don't have to go to him, make him come to you. 
He forgot that Imam Malik doesn't, it's not as simple as it going to the officials. No way. So he laughed. The governor of Medina laughed and he said, come on, let's go. So he went to Imam Malik's house. They knocked on the door and the housemaid, the servant of Imam Malik, answered. And they asked for Imam Malik, the prince, the governor of Medina. She said to him, listen, if there is a religious question, right now is not the time. Write it on a paper and he will answer it for you. If you want to learn hadith, go to his circles of daras, they'll be in a certain time. And if it's a government issue, this is not the time, there's another time for it. So the governor of Medina says, I have a letter for him from the prince of Mecca. So then a big, tall man, blonde, white, colored eyes, unexpected from the people of Medina came to the door. So as I looked up at him and the servant lady brought him a chair, he sat on it. And then he said, what does the governor of Mecca want from me? And the governor of Medina just gave him the paper without a word. When Imam Malik read this paper, he threw the paper away saying, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Has it come to this that knowledge now needs connections? He looked at the young boy and the young boy said to him, Aslaha Allahu shaykh. May Allah straighten the path of the shaykh. Out of respect, young boy. He said to him, I am a Qurashi. I am from the lineage of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So now, basically, he forced, he obliged the Imam to listen to him. You have to respect the lineage of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Qurashi. I have memorized the Quran at the age of seven. And your muwatta, the whole of it, I've memorized it with this chain of narrations by the age of ten. My mother sent me here to learn from you. Imam Malik looked at him and said, Ya Ghulam, O oh young boy, ittaqillah. Fear Allah, bil ma'asi, and stay away from sins. If you do so, there will be something of your future if you apply these two advices. Does anyone know who the young boy was? So he was Imam Muhammad ibn Idris a Shafia. You thought he wasn't going to be a Shafia. If there was any title that I would give to Imam al-Shafi'i, it would be my choice of the encyclopedist. Encyclopedist. In the encyclopedia, you'll find information about almost anything. And explains almost everything and anything. And his knowledge, different to the other Imams, was almost in every area and every subject that you can know about. As for Imam Shafi'i's gift, he had a gift of memory. Now all the ulama had this gift, but Imam al-Shafi'i, he was the pinnacle of this. He stood out in memory. As I said, he memorized the Qur'an at seven. He was a poet at ten, a reference poet at ten. And as I said, he memorized the Muwatta at ten or thirteen years of age with all the chain of narrators and the sayings of the companions and so on and so forth, word by word, letter by letter. He read the Qur'an every single day of his life. It is said that he, mem he read the whole Qur'an every day. And it's not an exaggeration, Allahu A'lam, maybe the time in those days, in that first 300 years after the Prophet ﷺ, there was barakah in the time, some scholars say. He had an uncle who was a scholar. And in those days, they all learned this thing called farasa, ilm al-farasa. It's a science of looking at a person, and from their features, you are able to see signs of particular qualities in the person. And at the age of about 10 or 11, he says to him, Son, I see brilliance and intelligence in you. Brothers and sisters, there's something really interesting to know. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal considered Imam al-Shafi'i as what we call Mujaddid. He said, Imam al-Shafi'i Mujaddid al-Mi'atu Thaniya. He is the reformer of the second 100 years. There's a hadith of the Prophet which is Sahih. 
He said, every 100 years, every century, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings about someone to reform this din, to take the people back to the original teachings of the Prophet People go lost. So instead of sending a prophet, he sends a alim that brings these people back. And the scholars agree that the first one, the first mujaddid after the Prophet in the first century was none other than the Khalifa Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. The second mujaddid, in the view of many scholars, including Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, it was Imam al Shafi'i. Some people got jealous of Imam al Shafi'i. Imam Ahmad's son, Abdullah, said to his, asked his father one time about Imam al Shafi'i's views, and his father said, Son, Anyone reaching the caliber of Imam Shafi'i will accuse him of what he is not. The students of Imam Malik became extreme in their following of Imam Malik. And after he died, Imam Shafi'i found that people were saying, Qala Rasulullah. And the others would say, Qala Imam Malik. And say, but Imam Malik said, and he knows about the Prophet more than you. Even though something was clear. So Imam Shafi'i wanted to draw a line. Came up with the book and he wrote, evidence against some of the errors of his teachers. Because of this, and because of all these different accusations, and because Imam Shafi became the top in the world in his time, Imam Malik's students, and this is a problem, they hated him a lot, and they waited for him when he was delivering a dars in the masjid in Yemen. They entered upon him, and after he finished his lesson, they attacked him. And they beat him until he became unconscious. He died a few days later. Now the scholars say he didn't die directly from the wounds. So he wasn't, they don't say he was murdered by his students. But he had another disease, another illness. That when he got beaten up, it exacerbated, he made it worse, and then he died. He stayed in his own, he died there. But as a result of that beating up by the students of his great Imam and great master. We call this, there's a word called paradox. Have you ever heard of that word? Paradox. If you fill the cup too much and it spills over, no one likes that. If you have food and you add too much salt in it, it tastes nice with salt. But if you put a kilo of salt in it, the food is ruined. If you put no salt at all, you can't taste it. So anything that goes to extremes becomes corrupt and destruction. If you want me to give a title to Imam Ahmad, I don't know, subhanAllah. He was a copycat of the Prophet And this is what Imam Ahmad Muhammad is known for. Imam Ahmad uh, was a poor person financially, very poor. And he was born like that, lived like that, died as a poor person. Poor in finance, not poor in heart or soul. Imam Ahmad prayed every day 300 rak'ah. And that was when he was young. Imam Ahmad is said to have known, some narrations say, up to a million. That's mixed between Sahih Hadith and Daif Hadith. And he was able to know which ones from which. The trial in his time, he went through a trial more than any other Imam went through. He went through this trial of this issue called Khalq al-Qur'an, al -Khalq al -Qur the creation of the Qur'an. This group of people came along and they said, the Qur'an is not the word of Allah, it is the creation of Allah. Because speech is created and speech was came after Allah. Therefore, the Quran is speech and it is created like you and me. It is not the words of Allah. Which means that it can it, it, it can be it can err, it can make mistakes, because every creation of Allah is fallible. 
infallible. It makes mistakes. It's not perfect. So therefore they're implying the words of Allah are not perfect. He made up this thing and he came to the Khalifa al mamun and he convinced him about the Khalq of the Qur'an. At first, al Khalifa al mamun did not impose it on people. He said, I believe in this, but he didn't impose it. But then this man came back to him and said to him, I can't recall his name, but he said to him, no, you have to tell the people this is part of Aqid and I have to agree on it. And if they don't agree, it is disbelief. So then after three years, al mamun stood up on this rampage. He said, everybody must accept it. The Khalifa ordered that they be put in chains and brought as prisoners. On his way, he made a dua. He said, Oh Allah, Allahumma la tajma'ni bil ma'moon. Oh Allah, do not let me meet ma'moon. The second day, they came back and they said, you have to be returned. Why? He said, your sentence has been suspended. The Khalifa died. Wallahi, this is true. The Khalifa got sick and he died. But before that, Al-Mu'tasim, his brother, took over. Imam Ahmad was brought into chains before the Khalifa. At first, Al-Mu'tasim tried to yield. He said, Ya yeah, Imam, please, you are a respected person. I'll let you go. Say what they are saying. Ya yeah, Imam, please. Ya yeah, Imam, please. And the Imam Ahmad said to Khalifa, he said, Ya yeah, Khalifa, Ya yeah, Amir al muminin So he acknowledged his Imara. He said to him, give me one evidence from the Quran that the Quran is created. I cannot find any evidence. Give me evidence and I'll accept. Nothing personal. al Mu'tasim couldn't find anything. Then he said, take him to the prison. He went. Second day he came out. And this time, Ahmad ibn Abi Du'ad and his scholars around there. He said, I have evidence from the Quran that the Quran is created. He said, which one? He said, Allah says, we have sent this Quran down in the Arabic language. Imam Ahmad looked at him and said, Allah did not say we have created the Quran in the Arabic language. He said, we have sent down the Quran in Arabic language. This does not mean it is created. They put him back in the prison. Third day, fourth day, fifth day. Imam Atasim is trying to yield. Please, I'll let you go with your family. Just say it and I'll let you go. Imam Ahmad determined, I will not say it. This is deen. It's not my religion. It's religion of Allah. On his way, I didn't mention when he was going through the deserts. On his way. Subhanallah, it was not an alim. It was not a scholar or a shaykh or a judge who came to him to give him strength. You know who came to him? A simple Bedouin who hardly knows anything, even reading or writing. He came up to him and he said, Ya Imam, I hear that you have been summoned to say that the Quran is created. Ya Imam, stand strong. Never say these words. A Bedouin from the desert. When he reached Baghdad, they began. On the fifth or sixth day, the whip was brought out. First day, second day, whips after whips. The doctor says, I saw his back. There were like caves inside his back. Then they saw him after a few days of whipping. And this is in history. Believe it or not, Allahu A'lam. They saw him say some words. They couldn't understand it. But one of the writers says, later on, I understood what he was saying. He was saying, Oh Allah, do not let my aura show. His pants were slipping off. All this mattered not to him except that his aura would show. The person who's writing says, Wallahi, I saw his pants by themselves somehow make their way up and they were tight on his body and never fell. Believe it or not. One man came to him and they felt sorry for him. And he said to him, Ya Imam, just get yourself out of this. We can't bear seeing you like this. He looked at him and he said, Are you a student of knowledge? He said, Yes. He said, look outside the window of this small door of this prison. He looked outside and he said, Mada tara? What do you see? He said, I see people I cannot count in numbers. Thousands and thousands of people waiting outside. You could see the open. They are carrying pencil, uh, they are carrying pens, feathers of pens, and writing material that they write on. He said to them, They are students of knowledge. Innahum yantadiruna qawli. They are waiting for what I have to say. They're going to write what I have to say. And for the generations to come in the future, this is what the knowledge will be. I am the last standing on this. I must stand firm. They are waiting for my word and they're going to take it.